And thanks for being with us on this Monday evening, February 6th, as we recap what happened in the courtroom today in the Alec Murdoch double murder trial. The disgraced attorney accused of shooting and killing his wife Maggie and son Paul in June of 2021. After we go over today's testimony and what happened in the courtroom, we're going to be joined by our experts, two criminal defense attorneys, for their take on what happened earlier today. In all, seven witnesses took the stand in the Collington County Courthouse today, including a family caregiver, a former law partner, and the attorney for the family of Mallory Beach. But statements today that may have the biggest impact on the trial were from Judge Clifton Newman. He decided prosecutors can include testimony about Murdoch's alleged financial crimes in their case. The judge said the looming exposure of financial crimes shows motive. He added that a motive is not necessary That's in a murder right. case, but it that. could be used to establish malice which is required for a murder conviction. Newman adds that he does not feel that the financial testimony will lure jurors into a murder conviction based on other crimes. This evidence furnishes a part of the context of the alleged crime. It's necessary to the full presentation of the case uh, which the state is entitled, uh, particularly since the state is relying heavily on circumstantial evidence. I find that it is so intimately connected with and explanatory of the crime charged under the theory that the state um, is seeking to prove that proof of it is essential to complete the story. And his decision came after two more witnesses testified to the court without the jury present today. Attorney Mark Tensley represents the family of Mallory Beach in their civil suit against Murdoch. Beach was killed in a boating accident in February of 2019 while Paul Murdoch was allegedly drunk and driving the boat. Tinsley was suing Alec Murdoch personally over that boat wreck. He told the court he didn't believe Murdoch when he told him he was broke. And I didn't see how any reasonable person wouldn't settle the case, especially Ellick. Um, so I, I expected the case to settle. 90% of cases settle, maybe 99. But if we had to try it, yes, we were going to try it. And if he were unable to offer more money, um, then your it, it, expectation on, say, on June 7th, you know, before these murders, your expectation was if he doesn't offer more money, we're going to trial. Any money. Right. It was, it was no money. It, right. no, no money had been offered. So your expectation then was we're going to trial. It, if you offer me no money in a case that I'm pursuing against you, then, then the response is uh, we are going to trial. And, and you were pretty far from trial on June 7th, uh, 2021, were you not? No. Also on the witness stand today, Michelle Smith, she worked for as a caregiver for years for Alec Murdoch's mom. Days after the murder, she says Murdoch talked about visiting his parents the night of the shooting deaths. But she says she doesn't remember him being at his parents' house as long as he claims. Take a listen. He was telling you or saying to you that he was at the house? Mm -hmm. When? Um, the night of the murders. The, the night. night of the murders? Yes. So what was he telling you about that he was at the house the night of the murders? That he'd been there 30 to 40 minutes. Was he there 30 to 40 minutes that night? Not to my recall. Why are you crying, Miss Because it's a good fam, a good family, and I love working there. Well, the defense cross-examined Smith, con uh, confirming with her that Murdoch would visit his parents frequently more than his other siblings. Now, Smith was also questioned about a blue tarp that was found at Murdoch's you may home, the par his parents' home, I should box. say. She testified that days after the murders. Murdoch came to his parents' house with a blue tarp in his arms. She said he arrived at 6.30 in the morning, a time of day that he never visited. After you hear from her, you're also going to hear from SLED. Take a listen. Well, what did he do then? He came inside. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, did he have anything or was he holding anything? He had a blue something in his hand. Say that one more time. A blue tarp, blue something in his hand, something blue. A blue something in his hand. Mm -hmm. and, uh, can you show me how he was holding it? 
Like uh, this. Is it all right if I touch it? Yeah, that's fine. How, how is he doing it? Like this. Like that. Holding something like this? Yes. And what did it look like? Like a, a blue tart, like a tart. Blue? Blue. Okay. You found a blue tarp, is that right? Yes, sir. And in that blue tarp, there were dishes wrapped up in that blue tarp, right? No, sir. No dishes were wrapped in the blue tarp. It was folded on top of the dishes. Okay. So you seized the blue tarp, right? Yes, sir. And did you do any um, testing of the blue tarp to see if there was blood? No, sir. I did not do any testing on the blue tarp. Do you know anyone who did any blue testing on the blue tarp? I am unaware of any testing done on the blue tarp. Moore testified that a blue raincoat was collected from the home as well. And testing on that blue raincoat was a focus of Jamie Hall's testimony. She is a uh, former sled forensics investigator. She described, described to the court how the coat was tested for gunshot residue inside and out. Hall also conducted tests on the clothes Alec Murdoch was wearing when police arrived at the scene of the murders. And we are now being joined by our legal experts tonight, criminal defense attorneys Brian and Luke Sheely. Guys, thank you so very much for your time. Thanks for having us. Let's dive into what happened today. I know on Friday night's broadcast, both of you were saying that if the judge allowed the allegations of financial mismanagement charges, whatever you want to call it, against Alec Murdoch in this trial to be used as evidence, then basically his goose was cooked. Are you guys sticking by that tonight? Correct. Uh, yeah, it seemed like Judge Newman was heavily leaning towards allowing that type of evidence. He took the weekend to think about it. We heard a little bit more today from uh, Attorney Tinsley, and then he made his ruling. And it's coming in, and it's not just a part of it, it's all of it. From confrontations the day of the incident, to fraudulent clients, to fraud against the bank, everything. And so it's very bad news for defense. Brian, what's your take on all this? Uh, the financial allegations against Murdoch being allowed, what, what's that going to mean in this trial? It means that Alec Murdoch has got a, an uphill. Um, you know, the judge is really supposed to be the gatekeeper, uh, but he's also supposed to consider what the state considers its motive. And so here, whether the state honestly believes that's the motive or, or can't think of anything else to really come up with as the motive, they are um, going to be allowed to talk about all these other bad acts, financial malfeasance. And like I said previously, I, I think it's going to make it incredibly hard for Mr. Murdoch because he's going to have to take the fifth. He's going to have to deal with a jury that knows from credible witnesses that he's a liar. And if they didn't have that information coming in, they can kind of look at this in a clean way. So Luke and I have been talking about this all day. The criminal defense lawyers in us cringe at this kind of evidence coming in, uh, but it's, it, it's great for the state. It helps them tell their story. Um, Judge Newman was talking about race gesti, and that is exactly that, that, the state's ability to be able to tell their story how they see fit here. And you talk about the alleged financial crimes committed by Alec Murdoch. The state, the prosecution here, basically saying that the motive in all of this, the motive for killing his wife and his son, they say, is to buy him more time, a distraction, um, so to say, so he could focus on the financial allegations against him? Is that what you guys are picking up? That is what the state is saying, and we really try to wrestle with that. I understand that they, without that, they have really no motive. They have this, this hor horrible situation, these horrific crimes in a vacuum, so they want a motive, and you have this just wealth of other bad crimes and wrongs, so but to say it's a distraction or it was a way to prevent uncovering financial crimes, there's just something missing there. Again, if they had, if we were going to hear some evidence about, you know, late night calls to the insurance carrier about tweaking life insurance mm -hmm. and amounts of payouts, to me that would have a sufficient nexus where you could really say, boom, there's a motive. But just to say this would be like, look over here. Uh, look at me, I'm a victim, and to say that would somehow put off the discovery of the crimes, it's just missing something. Um, so we'll see what the jury thinks. You agree with that? I do, and I, I just thinking about this, now that we know this evidence is coming in and that Alec Murdoch is going to have to deal with it, the one thing that he's going to not have to worry about anymore is his own character. Early on, um, Dick Carpoolian and Jim Griffin were tiptoeing around, not opening the door, to his character for fear that all this would come in. It came in 
And so I think you saw that a little bit today with Jim Griffin um, when he was examining another one of Paul's friends. And he, he got to really freely go into the idea that you know, Alec Murdaugh was the, the father figure to all of Paul's friends and Maggie was the mother mm-hmm. figure and that Maggie and, and Alec's relationship was, was great. And so they're going to be diving into building up his character knowing what's coming down the pipeline. I want to go into the testimony of the caregiver for Murdoch's mom, uh, Michelle Smith, I believe is her name, testifying today that Murdoch was indicating that perhaps he had been at his parents' house 30 or 40 minutes. She remembers 20 minutes, but she also gave a time frame, I believe, somewhere between 8.30 to 9.30. Well, we know that the dog kennel video was made about 8.45 tonight, so if his voice is on that tape, there's no way he's at his parents' house at 8.30 that evening, correct? That's right. Um, so it, that was pretty fascinating. I don't think the state is wanting the jury to think that that 8.30 to 9.30 is set in stone. She just knows that they watched a certain TV program at that right. time. But what she does know is someone that's you know, a friend of the family, a longtime caregiver, is that he came, that she described it as being somewhat unusual due to him usually not coming on her shifts. But that was an unusual day. That was the day that his father went in the hospital. He came, um, the state wanted to point out that he was fidgety, but then again, she said he was always fidgety. Mm -hmm. He held his mom's hand, they laid in bed, and she was saying today on on direct that it was about 20 minutes. Turns out it looks like previously she had said more, maybe 30, 40 minutes, so that was the battle today. She had a lot of built-in kind of inconsistent testimony, which which can be normal for a a lay witness who's not a professional witness. But there was this huge debate about whether we're talking about he had in his hands days later a blue tarp or a blue raincoat. The state very much wanted it to be maybe a blue raincoat he had because that's what they found in the closet later and that's what we think is going to have gunshot residue. But today on the stand, she was pretty consistent. I saw a tarp and the tarp was a thing that they found but never tested. So. But she's also testifying that he brought it over at like 6.30 in the morning, didn't she? And then she said he never came over that early in the morning. Right. Um, yeah, JR, that's true. And, you know, the thing about that is that, you know, her tes- she was the most, in my opinion, the most captivating witness, not credible, not the most credible, but the most captivating witness in this entire trial. She wasn't a member of law enforcement. She wasn't an expert for the state. Now, she was someone very, very familiar with a family member, like some of these friends of Paul Murdoch. But unlike those friends, she was there the night of and interacted with Alec Murdoch. So, but like my brother has suggested, she's been interviewed multiple times by both the state and the defense. And the, the idea of a blue tarp came in really, as she testified to, she got into an accident and mentioned it to a responding officer in her own accident sometime later. Um, and that kind of got the attention of law enforcement and by her own testimony, this, you know, visualization of whether it was a tarp or a raincoat would have happened over a week from the mm-hmm. night of the killing. So, you know, right now, Dick Arputlian and Jim Griffin are making a relevance argument right now for that very reason. Um, is it a tarp? Is it a raincoat? She basically, basically said, kind of, I saw both. Mm-hmm. They're debating about pulling up the transcripts and taking a look at that. And then there's a big relevance argument on, so what if there is GSR on a raincoat in a closet in Hampton County? I think Dick Arpulian said there's a lot of GSR and a lot of coats, but it is very much removed from the time of the killing. And they, and they were doing a good job trying to, um, for the state saying, yeah, she misidentified a tarp for a raincoat. Right. And then on the other side for the defense saying it never was this raincoat. We have pulled out this tarp right fresh from the Kmart package, kind of dramatically um, in court. And she identified that as pretty much what she saw. And then I think John Metters did a great job of after Jim Griffin made the sled analyst actually open the box, which is another dramatic moment in court today. John Metters did a really good job of of pretty much having uh, that witness say, yeah, that could have been what I saw. So it's fascinating. She was very emotional on the stand at times today, too. Uh, breaking, you know, br- crying several times. And when she was asked point blank, why are you crying? She cared for this family. And I think that showed to the jury today. It, it did, and that's one of the reasons Brian said, I think that she's very compelling. 
she's conflicted. She worked for this family for a long time. Mm -hmm. She knows them personally. She even said Alec Murdoch is a, Does that a good to person. The, like, the object you've she didn't waver on that, but at so the same time, she knows there's this terribly suspicious death. Yes. It's uprooted probably her personal life for these several years in that small town. And most, I will say this as a defense lawyer that encounters this a lot, most lay witnesses when they get on a trial, especially a high profile trial, they want to do what they, they want to be on the side of what the world considers right. And right, right or wrong, generally the prosecution is right. And the guy with the double murder charge is kind of a bad guy. So she's sitting here conflicted, knowing that she's testifying in a way that could very well put her former employer in prison for the rest of his life but also wants to kind of do the right thing so it's it's very easy to understand why she's tearful and conflicted i know late last week uh, the judge in the case said that both sides needed to get together to try to work out some testimony here when it comes to the alleged financial crimes any idea if that was done or is the judge just going to let whoever the state wants to testify testify and this trial according to the defense will stretch out a couple more weeks longer with this testimony yeah, it's going to stretch out, Jr. Um, what we saw in the in-camera proceeding outside the presence of the jury, we're going to see all of that again, but it'll be slowed down. There'll be more objections because you're in front of a jury. There'll be more rigorous cross-examination. We didn't get a lot of objections to in-camera testimony because it really is for the judge to just kind of take in the evidence. It's, sa it's a safe spot. The jury's not hearing it mm -hmm. for the time being. But it's going to definitely lengthen what's coming next because we're going to hear all that again and it's going to be dramatic. Testimony started on a Thursday, I do believe, not last week, but the week before. So we've had seven, eight days of testimony now. There was some speculation early on this trial may last two, maybe three weeks, but I think it's going to be a little bit longer than that, the way we're going right now. I think so. And I think perhaps that early speculation was maybe under the assumption that all of this bad character financial crimes evidence might not come in. Again, that would be kind of the clean version of the trial, um, but it's coming in, it's there to provide motive according to the judge. So that's, we're gonna have three, four days of that. Then we'll see what else they have. Again, we still haven't heard from pathologists, mm -hmm. DNA, right. whoever might be the wrap up lead investigator. And then the defense gets to put on its case. So it's, we don't wanna lose sight of the fact that every one of these financial crimes, I mean, there's. I think, I just think from the reporting, it might be 10, 20, 30, 40. They all, you know, technically have a case somewhere in a different court. So we're going to, we're basically going to have little mini trials. Well, Luke, we haven't heard from Curtis Smith either. You forgot about that's Curtis true. Smith. That's, that's going to be, that's going to be almost like a closing witness. Um, mm -hmm. I think Creighton Waters referred to him today as a, as a summary witness. Right. So that's going to be, that's going to be compelling. And that was Murdoch's best friend, correct? That was the gentleman that um, allegedly tried to do the assisted suicide right. on the side of the road. Got it. Who has a whole lot more to say, apparently. All right. As far as gunshot residue is concerned, we talked about that just a moment, a, a moment ago. I don't think they said for sure one way or the other today if they found gunshot residue. And I think if they have found it, they would have told us by now, right? Well, that last witness we got on gunshot residue, she's the one that collects it to then send to an analyst to write a report and say it is yay or nay and what the particles mean. And so we're, we're gonna get gunshot residue. It's pretty clear from the state's opening. It's gonna be on his car seat, on his shoulder seat belt. It's gonna be in other places. It's gonna definitely be on that raincoat as much as they care about it. The question is, can it be explained? And you started to hear um, Jim Griffin ask those kind of questions to that kind of collecting um, technician about, well, you know that you can get transfer just from holding guns or touching people that mm -hmm. have been around guns. And she didn't want to answer that question for him, but the ultimate uh, expert on gunshot who did the report, they will be required to answer those questions. Well, it has been fascinating to see this all start unfolding over the last several days. It's like a, almost a chess match at times in court. They're making this move, they're making this move and they're setting it up for the end game here, which is trying to get a murder conviction, a double murder conviction with the jury. At this point, with all of these days of testimony, you've got those 12 jurors sitting there. Do you guys think at this point they are following along closely? Do you think they may have some doubts about something that's been said in court so far? 
I think they would have been following extremely closely to today's testimony, especially from Ms. Smith, because like I said, she's a different kind of witness. She's there. We're finally hearing from someone that, you know, that knows the players and saw Alec Murdoch the night in question. Um, and she was emotional mm -hmm. and she was real. She's a member of the community. I mean, she's not a professional witness. Um, so I think if maybe they've been snoozing a little bit, especially as there are breaks, um, with the in-camera testimony where they're kind of twiddling their thumbs in a jury room wondering what's going on. I think they probably sat up today. There's a lot of good direct examination and cross examination from both sides. So yeah, I think their, their attention is back to where it needs to be right now. All right, Brian and Luke Sheely, guys, thank you as always. Thanks for having us. Thank All you. right, and of course, uh, testimony resumes tomorrow morning at 9.30. You can watch the trial of Alec Murdoch you can watch it on WLTX.com. You can watch it on our YouTube channel. You can also watch it on WLTX Plus. And of course, we have our team coverage there for you as well. We do have one important programming note to tell you about now. Tomorrow night, our evening recap is going to air one hour earlier. Why? Well, this is due to President Biden's State of the Union address, which starts at 9. So you can watch the trial of Alec Murdoch after hours. Again, this will be tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. So make a note of that. You're used to joining us at 9 o'clock at night, one hour earlier tomorrow evening. And our live team coverage will continue tomorrow on WLTX. We'll see you then.